The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 22 uh, I hope you've had a super Christmas and a New Year and your festive season has been splendid and marvellous and, and wonderful. I've had a very good one, all things considered. Of course, we've had, all of us, uh, unusual festive seasons I think um, I think there are very few places on the planet perhaps if there are some people in New Zealand listening uh, you're amongst the lucky ones that had probably as close to a, a as normal uh, uh, time as, as ever uh, I should say hello to my mother hello mum she's, she's said hello from uh, England I live in Denmark by the way in case anyone didn't understand that uh, hello Andrew Fay hello more Garner Gray, um, give me a heads up if you're listening in. Uh, it's always lovely to get a hello from you guys. I really appreciate that. Uh, once again, thank you all of you for listening in to the live versions on Facebook. Uh, and to those of you that are listening to the podcasts on uh, whichever uh, sort of channel you get it from, uh, I, I massively appreciate the support uh, that, that you give me. Um, so thank you very much for that. I will do my, my obligatory little bit of, of advertising, as it were, at the beginning and ask you all, um, if you can uh, and you're able to, um, to consider becoming a patron uh, of The Bearded Wit. Um, as some of you know, I've been doing this for quite some time. I'm also working on another podcast called The Rats in the Walls, uh, which will be a lot of sort of gothic and ghost and uh, sort of uh, more cerebral horror stories, not blood and guts, some of the really old classic stuff, M.R. James uh, and so on, that sort of stuff. Um, and if you would consider becoming a patron uh, of The Bearded Wit, I would massively help, uh, that would massively help me uh, because I want to do this uh, as much as possible for you guys. So if you can go to Patreon, uh, www, all the Ws, dot Patreon dot com forward slash the bearded wit and have a look there are various levels of support that you can consider offering um i would be very very grateful for the support uh, any support that you can give um so if you can give some thought to that i would appreciate that so that's www.patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit yes there we go all right folks right let's crack on so um before the New Year, Folderol, Falala, and other malarkey, uh, we got to a point in So Long and Thanks for All the Fish where um, Fenchurch and Arthur have finally got their SH1T together. They've met up. Uh, lots and lots of, of sort of coinkydinkses uh, occurring, getting them together. And we found out at the end of the last uh, um, uh, reading that actually Arthur dropped his copy of the guide in Fenchurch's brother's car. And that meant, basically, she was she knew I mean, it kind of seemed to make sense to her that something was going on because she's been living in this sort of parallel universe. Um, and, and appreciates that something very, very weird has been going on. So they've been on their, I suppose, really their first proper date uh, after the uh, uh, the conversation in um, uh, Taunton. Was it Taunton? Yeah, it was Taunton, wasn't it? Taunton uh, um, Railway Station. So let's crack on. Um, they have just been for a very unusual evening in Hyde Park, uh, and we pick up from there. We have just, as I say, uh, realised uh, or been shown um, by uh, Fenchurch that she has a copy of the guide, or she has Arthur's copy of the guide. <clears throat> Ooh, so I'm just going to have a quick slurp of tea first. I hope you have tea or whatever your favourite tipple is to hand. Um, and Happy New Year. Here's to a really good 2021, everyone. Ah, right. 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is, as has been remarked before often and accurately, a pretty startling kind of thing. It is essentially, as the title implies, a guidebook. The problem is, or rather one of the problems, for there are many, a sizable proportion of which are continually clogging up the civil, commercial and criminal courts in all areas of the galaxy, and especially, where possible, the more corrupt ones, this. The previous sentence makes sense. That is not the problem. This is. Change. Read it through again and you'll get it. The galaxy is a rapidly changing place. There is frankly so much of it, every bit of which is continually on the move, continually changing. A bit of a nightmare, you might think, for a scrupulous and conscientious editor diligently striving to keep this massively detailed and complex electronic tome abreast of all the changing circumstances and conditions that the galaxy throws up every minute of every hour of every day. And you'd be wrong. Where would you be wrong uh, would be in failing to realise that the editor like all the editors the guide has ever had, has no real grasp of the meanings of the words scrupulous, conscientious, or diligent, and tends to get his nightmares through a straw. Entries tend to get updated, or not, across the sub-Ethernet according to if they read good. Take, for example, the case of Brequinda in The Foth of Avalars, famed in myth, legend and stultifyingly dull Tri-D miniseries, as home of the magnificent and magical Forlornis Fire Dragon. In ancient days, before the advent of the Sorth of Bragadox, when the Fragilis sang and Saxaquine of the Quenelex held sway, when the air was sweet and the nights fragrant, but everywhere somehow managed to be or, sorry, everyone somehow managed to be, or so they claimed, though how on earth they could have thought that anyone was even remotely likely to believe such a preposterous claim, what with all the sweet air and fragrant nights and whatnots, is anyone's guess, virgins. It was not possible to heave a brick on Brequinda in the Foth of Avalars without hitting at least half a dozen forlornest fire dragons. Whether you'd want to do that, of course, is another matter. Not that fire dragons weren't an essentially peace-loving species, because they were. They adored it to bits, and this wholesale adoring of things to bits was often in itself the problem. One so often hurts the one one loves, especially if one is a forlornest fire dragon, with breath like a rocket booster and teeth like a park fence. Another problem was that once they were in the mood, they often went on to hurt quite a lot of the ones that other people loved as well. Add to all that the relatively small number of madmen who actually went around the place heaving bricks, and you'd end up with a lot of people on Brequinda in the Foth of Avalars seriously getting hurt by dragons. But did they mind? They did not. Were they heard to bemoan their fate? No. The Forlornis fire dragons were revered throughout the lands of Brequinda in the Foth of Avalars for their savage beauty, their noble ways, and their habit of biting people who didn't revere them. Why was this? The answer was simple. Sex. There is, for some unfathomed reason, something almost unbearably sexy about having huge, fire-breathing, magical dragons flying low about the sky on moonlit nights, which were already dangerously on the sweet and fragrant side. Why this should be so, the romance-besotted people of Brequinda in the Foth of Avalars could not have told you, and would not have stopped to discuss the matter once the effect was up and going, for no sooner would a flock of of half a dozen silk-winged, leather-bodied, forlornest fire-dragons heave into sight across the evening horizon than half the people of Brequinda were scurrying off into the woods 
with the other half, there to spend a busy, breathless night together and emerge with the first rays of dawn all smiling and happy and still claiming, rather endearingly, to be virgins. If rather flushed and sticky virgins. Pheromones, some researchers said. Something sonic, others claimed. The place was always stiff with researchers trying to get to the bottom of it all and taking a very long time about it. Not surprisingly, the guide's graphically enticing description of the general state of affairs on this planet has proved to be astonishingly popular amongst hitchhikers who allow themselves to be guided by it, and so it's simply never been taken out and it is therefore left to latter-day travellers to find out for themselves that today's modern Brequinda in the city-state of Avalars is now little more than concrete strip joints and dragon burger bars. The night in Islington was sweet and fragrant. There were, of course, no forlornest fire dragons about in the alley, but if any had chanced by, they might well have just sloped off across the road for a pizza, for they were not going to be needed. Had an emergency cropped up while they were still in the middle of their American hots with extra anchovy, they could always have sent across a message to put dire straits on the stereo, which is now known to have much the same effect. No, said Fenchurch. Not yet. Arthur put dire straits on the stereo. Fenchurch pushed ajar the upstairs front door to let in a little more of the sweet, fragrant night air. They both sat on some of the furniture made out of cushions, very close to the open bottle of champagne. No, said Fenchurch, not till you've found out what's wrong with me, which bit... But I suppose, she added very, very, very quietly, that we may as well start with where your hand is now. Arthur said, So, which way do I go? Down, said Fenchurch, on this occasion. He moved his hand. Down, she said, is in fact the other way. Oh, yes. Mark Knopfler has an extraordinary ability to make a Schecter custom Stratocaster hoot and sing like angels on a Saturday night, exhausted from being good all week and needing a stiff beer, which is not strictly relevant at this point since the record hadn't yet got to that bit, but there will be too much else going on when it does, and furthermore the chronicler does not intend to sit here with a track list and a stopwatch so it seems best to mention it now, while things are still moving slowly. "'And so we come,' said Arthur, "'to your knee. "'There is something terribly and tragically wrong with your left knee.' "'My left knee,' said Fenchurch, "'is absolutely fine.' (laughs) "'So it is. "'Did you know that? "'What?' "'Um,' It's all right. I can tell you do. No, keep going. So, it has to be something to do with your feet. She smiled in the dim light and wriggled her shoulders noncommittally against the cushions. Since there are cushions in the universe, on Scorn Shell as Beta to be exact, two worlds in from the swampland of the mattresses that actively enjoy being wriggled against particularly if it's non-committally because of the syncopated way in which the shoulders move, it's a pity they weren't there. They weren't. But such is life. Arthur held her foot, her left foot, in his lap and looked it over carefully. All kinds of stuff about the way her dress fell away from her legs was making it difficult for him to think particularly clearly at this point. I have to admit, he said, I really I really don't know what I'm looking for. You know when you'll find it, she said, 
really, you will. There was a slight catch in her voice. It's not that one. Feeling increasingly puzzled, Arthur let her left foot down onto the floor and moved himself around so that he could take her right foot. She moved forward, put her arms around and kissed him. Because the record had got to that bit, which, if you knew the record, you'd know would make it impossible not to do this. Then she gave him her right foot. He stroked it, ran his fingers around her ankle, under her toes, along her instep, and could find nothing wrong with it. She watched him with great amusement, laughed and shook her head. No, 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 don't stop, she said, but it's not that one now. Arthur stopped and frowned at her left foot on the floor. Don't stop. He stroked her right foot, ran his fingers around her ankle, under her toes, along her instep, and said, You mean it's something to do with the leg I'm, which I'm holding, or with which leg I'm holding? She did another of the shrugs which would have brought such joy into the life of a simple cushion from Scornshellus Beater. He frowned. Pick me up, she said quietly. He let her left foot down onto the floor and stood up. So did she. He picked her up in his arms and they kissed again. This went on for a while. And then she said, now put me down again. Still puzzled, he did so. Well, she looked at him almost challengingly. So what's wrong with my feet? she said. Arthur still did not understand. He sat on the floor and then got down on his hands and knees to look at her feet in situ, as it were, in their normal habitat. And as he looked closely, something odd struck him. He put his head right down to the ground and peered. There was a long pause. He sat back heavily. Yes, he said. I see what's wrong with your feet. They don't touch the ground. So, so what do you think? Arthur looked up at her quickly and saw the deep apprehension making her eyes suddenly dark. She bit her lip and was trembling. What? What do you... she stammered. Are you... She shook the hair forwards over her eyes that were filling with dark, fearful tears. He stood up quickly, put his arms around her and gave her a single kiss. Perhaps you can do what I can do, he said, and walked straight out of her upstairs front door. The record got to the good bit. Everybody go, aww. It's the sound effect of me having a slurp of tea. The battle raged on about the star of Zaxis. Hundreds of the fierce and horribly beweaponed Zirzla ships had now been smashed and wrenched to atoms by the withering forces of the huge silver Zaxisian ship was able to deploy. Part of the moon had gone too, blasted away by those same blazing force guns that ripped the very fabric of space as they passed through it. The Zirzla ships that remained, horribly beweaponed though they were, were now hopelessly outclassed by the devastating power of the Zexisian ship, and were fleeing for cover behind the rapidly disintegrating moon, when the Zexisian ship, in hurtling pursuit behind them, suddenly announced that it needed a holiday and left the field of battle. All was redoubled fear and consternation for a moment, but the ship was gone. 
With the stupendous powers at its command, it flitted across vast tracts of irrationally shaped space, quickly, effortlessly, and above all, quietly. Deep in his greasy, smelly bunk, fashioned out of a maintenance hatchway, Ford Prefect slept among his towels, dreaming of old haunts. He dreamed at one point, in his slumbers, of New York. In his dream, he was walking late at night along the east side, beside the river which had become so extravagantly polluted that new life forms were now emerging from it spontaneously, demanding welfare and voting rights. One of these now floated past, waving. Ford waved back. The thing thrashed to the shore and struggled up the bank. Hi, it said. I've just been created. I'm completely new to the universe in all respects. Is there anything you could tell me? Whew, said Ford, a little nonplussed. I could tell you where some bars are, I guess. What about love and happiness? I sense deep needs for things like that, it said, waving its tentacles. Got any leads there? Well, you can get something like what you require, said Ford, on 7th Avenue. I instinctively feel, said the creature urgently, that I need to be beautiful, am I? Uh, You're pretty direct, aren't you? No point in mocking about, am I? The thing was oozing all over the place now, squelching and blubbering. A nearby wino was getting interested. To me, said Ford, no. But listen, he added after a moment, most people make out, you know. Are there any others like you down there? Search me, buster, said the creature. As I said, I'm new here. Life is entirely strange to me. What's it like? Here was something that Ford felt he could speak about with authority. Life, he said, is like a grapefruit. Er, how so? Well, it's sort of orangey-yellow and dimpled on the outside, wet and squidgy in the middle. It's got pips inside, too. Oh, and some people have half a one for breakfast. Is there anyone else out there I can talk to? I expect so, said Ford. Ask a policeman. Deep in his bunk, Ford Prefect wriggled and turned onto his other side. It wasn't his favourite type of dream because it didn't have eccentric Columbits, the triple-breasted whore of Eroticon 6 in it, whom many of his dreams did feature. But at least it was a dream, and at least he was asleep. Luckily, there was a strong updraft in the alley because Arthur hadn't done this sort of thing for a while, at least not deliberately, and deliberately is exactly the way you are not meant to do it. He swung down sharply, nearly catching himself a nasty crack on the jaw with the doorstep, and tumbled through the air, so suddenly stunned with what profoundly stupid thing he had just done that he completely forgot the bit about hitting the ground, and didn't. Nice trick, he thought to himself, if you can do it. The ground was hanging menacingly above his head. He tried not to think about the ground, what an extraordinary big thing it was, and how much it would hurt him if he decided to stop hanging there, and suddenly fell on him. He tried to think nice thoughts about lemurs instead, which was exactly the right thing to do, because he couldn't at that moment remember precisely what a lemur was. If it was one of those things that sweep in great majestic herds across the plains of wherever it was, or if that was wildebeests. So it was a tricky kind of thing to think nice thoughts about without simply resorting to an icky general sort of well-disposedness towards things. And all this kept his mind well occupied, while his body tried to adjust to the fact that it wasn't touching anything. A Mars bar wrapper fluttered away down the alleyway. After a seeming moment of doubt and indecision, it eventually allowed the wind to ease it, fluttering between him and the ground. Arthur? The ground was still hanging menacingly above his head, and he thought it was probably time to do something about that, such as fall away from it, which is what he did. Slowly, very, 
very slowly. As he fell slowly, very, very slowly, he closed his eyes carefully, so as not to jolt anything. The feel of his eyes closing ran down his whole body. Once it had reached his feet, and the whole of his body was alerted to the fact that his eyes were now closed and was not panicked by it, he slowly, very, very slowly, revolved his body one way, and his mind the other. That should sort out the ground. He could feel air clear about him now, breezing around him quite cheerfully, untroubled by his being there, and slowly, very, very slowly, as from a deep and distant sleep, he opened his eyes. He had flown before, of course, flown many times on cricket until all the bird talk had driven him scatty, but this was different. Here he was on his own world, quietly and without fuss, beyond a sight beyond a slight trembling which could have been attributable to a number of things being in the air. Ten or fifteen feet below him was the hard tarmac and a few yards off to the right the yellow street lights of Upper Street. Luckily the alleyway was dark since the light which was supposed to see it through the night was on an ingenious time switch which meant it came on just before lunchtime and went off again as the evening was beginning to draw in. He was, therefore, safely shrouded in a blanket of dark obscurity. He, slowly, very, very slowly, lifted his head up to Fenchurch, who was standing in silent, breathless amazement, silhouetted in her upstairs doorway. His face was inches from his. I was about to ask you, she said in a low, trembly voice, what you were doing. But then I realised that I could see what you were doing. You were flying, so it seemed. She went on after a slight wandering pause. It seemed like a bit of a silly question. Arthur said, Can you do it? No. Would you like to try? She bit her lip and shook her head, not so much to say no, but just in sheer bewilderment. She was shaking like a leaf. It's quite easy, urged Arthur, if you don't know how. That's the important bit. Be not at all sure how you're doing it. Just to demonstrate how easy it was, he floated away down the alley, fell upwards quite dramatically, and bobbed back down to her like a new banknote on a breath of wind. Ask me how I did that. How did... how did you do that? No idea. Not a clue. She shrugged in bewilderment. So how can I... Arthur bobbed down a little lower and held out his hand. I want you to try, he said to step onto my hand, just one foot. What? Try it. Nervously, hesitantly almost, she told herself, as if she was trying to step out onto the hand of someone who was floating in front of her in in mid-air, she stepped onto his hand. Now the other. What? Take the weight off your back foot. I can't. Try it. Like this? Like that? Nervously, hesitantly almost, she told herself as if... She stopped telling herself what it was, what was she doing was like, because she had... Oh, I'll try that again, sorry guys. She stopped telling herself what was she... I'll try that a third time. She stopped telling herself what what she was doing was like, because she had a feeling... She didn't altogether want to know. She fixed her eyes 
very, very firmly on the guttering of the roof of the decrepit warehouse opposite, which had been annoying her for weeks because it was clearly going to fall off, and she wondered if anyone was going to do anything about it, or whether she ought to say something to somebody, and didn't think for a moment about the fact that she was standing on the hands of someone who wasn't standing on anything else at all. Now, said Arthur, take your weight off your left foot. I can't. Try. She hadn't seen the guttering from quite this angle before, and it looked to her now as if, well, as if the mud and gunge up there, and all in that, there might be a bird's nest. She leaned forward just a little and took her weight off her right foot. She could probably see it more clearly. Arthur was alarmed to see that someone down the alley was trying to steal her bicycle. He particularly didn't want to get involved in an argument at the moment and hoped that the guy would do it quietly and not look up. He had quite the shifty look of someone who habitually stole bicycles in alleys and habitually didn't expect to find their owners hovering several feet above them. He was relaxed by both these habits and went about his job with purpose and concentration, and when he found that the bike was unarguably bound by hoops of tungsten carbide to an iron bar embedded in concrete, he peacefully bent both its wheels and went on his way. Arthur let out a long-held breath. "'See what a piece of eggshell I've found you,' said Fenchurch in his ear. Motte oh, BG tips, lovely. Those who are regular followers of the doings of Arthur Dent may have received an impression of his character and habits which, while it includes the truth and, of course, nothing but the truth, falls somewhat short in its composition of the whole truth in all its glorious aspects. And the reasons for this are obvious. Editing, selection, the need to balance that which is interesting with that which is relevant and cut out all the tedious happenstance. Like this, for instance. Arthur Dent went to bed. He went up the stairs, all 15 of them, opened the door, went into his room, took off his shoes and socks and then all the rest of his clothes, one by one, and left them in a neatly crumpled heap on the floor. He put on his pyjamas, the blue ones with the stripe. He washed his face and hands and cleaned his teeth. He went to the lavatory, realised that he'd once again got this all in the wrong order and had to wash his hands again and went to bed. He read for 15 minutes, spending the first 10 minutes of that trying to work out where in the book he got to the previous night. Then he turned out the light and within a minute or two was asleep. It was dark. He lay on his left for a good hour. After that, he moved restlessly in his sleep for a moment and then turned over to sleep on his right side. Another hour after this, his eyes flickered briefly and he slightly scratched his nose, though there was still a good twenty minutes to go before he turned back onto his left side, and so he whiled away the night, sleeping. At four, he got up and went to the lavatory again. He opened the door to the lavatory, and so on. It's guff. It doesn't advance the action. It makes for nice fat books, such as the American market thrives on, but it doesn't actually get you anywhere. You don't, in short, want to know. But there are other omissions as well, besides the teeth cleaning and trying to find fresh socks variety, and in some of these people have often seemed inordinately interested. What, they want to know, about all the stuff on the wings with Arthur and Trillian, did that ever get anywhere? To which the answer is, of course, mind your own business. And what, they say, was he up to all those nights on the planet Cricket? Just because the planet didn't have Felornis fire dragons or dire straits doesn't mean that everyone just sat up every night reading. Or, to take a more specific example... What about the night after the committee meeting on prehistoric Earth when Arthur found himself sitting on a hillside watching the moon rise over the softly burning trees in company with a beautiful young girl called Mella, recently escaped from a lifetime of staring every morning at a hundred nearly identical photographs of moodily lit tubes of toothpaste in the art department of an advertising agency on the planet Golga Frincham? What then? What happened next? And the answer is, of course that the book ended.
The next one didn't resume the story until five years later, and you can, claim some, take discretion too far. This Arthur Dent comes the cry from the furthest reaches of the galaxy and has even now been found inscribed on a mysterious deep space probe thought to originate from an alien galaxy at a distance too hideous to contemplate. What is he? Man or mouse? Is he interested in nothing more than tea and the wider issues of life? Has he no spirit? Has he no passion? Does he not, to put it in a nutshell, fuck? Those who wish to know should read on. Others may wish to skip on to the last chapter, which is a good bit and has Marvin in it. Arthur Dent allowed himself for an unworthy moment to think, as they drifted up, that he very much hoped that his friends, who had always found him a pleasant but dull, or more latterly odd but dull, type of person, were having a good time in the pub. But that was the last time, for a while, that he thought of them. They drifted up, spiralling slowly around each other, like sycamore seeds falling from sycamore trees in the autumn, except going the other way. As they drifted up, their minds sang with the ecstatic knowledge that either what they were doing was completely and utterly and totally impossible, or that physics had a lot of catching up to do. Physics shook its head, and, looking the other way, concentrated on keeping the cars going along the Euston Road and out towards the Westway flyover, on keeping streetlights lit, and on making sure that when somebody on Baker Street drops a cheeseburger, it went splat on the ground. Dwindling headily beneath them, the beaded strings of lights of London, London, Arthur had to keep reminding himself, not the strange coloured fields of cricket, or the remote fringes of the galaxy, lighted freckles of which faintly spanned the opening sky above them, but London swayed, swaying and turning, turned. "'Try a swoop!' he called to Fenchurch. "'What?' Her voice seemed strangely clear but distant in all the vast empty air. It was breathy and faint with disbelief. All those things, clear, faint, distant, breathy, all at the same time. "'We're flying!' she said. A trifle, called Arthur. Think nothing of it. Try a swoop. A swoop. Her hand caught his, and in a second her weight caught it too, and stunningly she was gone, tumbling beneath him, clawing wildly at nothing. Physics glanced at Arthur, and clotted with horror, he was gone too, sick with giddy dropping, every part of him screaming, but his voice. They plummeted because this was London, and you really couldn't do this sort of thing here. He couldn't catch her because this was London, not a million miles from here, 756 million to be exact. In Pisa, Galileo had clearly demonstrated that two falling bodies fall at exactly the same rate of acceleration, irrespective of their relative weights. They fell. Arthur realised, as he fell, giddily and sickeningly, that if he was going to hang around in the sky believing everything that Italians had to say about physics when they couldn't even keep a simple tower straight, that they were in dead trouble, and damn well did fall faster than Fenchurch. He grappled her from above and fumbled for a tight grip on her shoulders. He got it. Fine. They were now falling together, which was all very sweet and romantic, but didn't solve the basic problem, which was that they were falling. And the ground wasn't waiting around to see if he had any more clever tricks up his sleeve, but was coming up to meet them like an express train. He couldn't support her weight. He hadn't anything to support it with or against. The only thing he could think was that they were obviously going to die, and if he wanted anything other than the obvious to happen, he was going to have to do something other than the obvious. Here, he felt like he was on familiar territory. 
He let go of her, pushed her away, and when she turned her face to him in a gasp of stunned horror, caught her little finger with his little finger, and swung her back upwards, tumbling clumsily up after her. Shit! she said, as she sat panting and breathlessly on absolutely nothing at all, and when she'd recovered herself, they fled on up into the night. Just below cloud level, they paused and scanned where they had impossibly come. The ground was not something to regard with any too firm or steady an eye, but merely to glance at, as if in passing. Fenchurch tried some little swoops, daringly, and found that if she judged herself just right against a body of wind, she could pull off some really quite dazzling ones with a little pirouette at the end, followed by a little drop that made her dress billow around her. And this is where readers who are keen to know what Marvin and Ford Prefect have been up to all this while should look ahead to later chapters, because Arthur could now wait no longer and helped her to take it off. It drifted down and away, whipped by the wind, until it was a speck which finally vanished, and for various complicated reasons, revolutionised the life of a family in Hounslow, over whose washing line it was discovered draped in the morning. In a mute embrace, they drifted up until they were swimming amongst the misty wraiths of moisture that you can see feathering around the wings of an aeroplane, but never feel because you're sitting warm inside the stuffy aeroplane and looking through the little scratchy perspex window, while somebody else's son tries patiently to pour warm milk into your shirt. Arthur and Fenchurch could feel them, wispy, cold and thin, wreathing around their bodies, very cold, very thin. They felt, even Fenchurch, now protected from the elements by only a couple of fragments from Marx and Spencer, that if they were not going to let the force of gravity bother them, then mere cold or paucity of atmosphere could go and whistle. The two fragments from Marx and Spencer, which, as Fenchurch rose now into the misty body of the clouds, Arthur removed very, very slowly, which is the only way it is possible to do when you're flying and also not using your hands, went on to create considerable havoc in the morning, respectively counting from top to bottom in Isleworth and Richmond. They were in the cloud for a long time because it was stacked very high, and when they finally emerged wetly above it, Fenchurch slowly spinning like a starfish lapped by a rising tide pool, they found that above the clouds is where the night gets seriously moonlit. The light is darkly brilliant. There are different mountains up there. But they are mountains with their own white arctic snows. They had emerged at the top of the high-stacked cumulonimbus and now began lazily to drift down its contours. As Fenchurch eased Arthur in turn from his clothes, prized him free uh, of them until all were gone, winding their surprised way down in the enveloping whiteness. She kissed him, kissed his neck, his chest, and soon they were drifting on, turning slowly in a kind of speechless T-shape, which might have caused even a forlornest fire dragon, had one flown past, replete with pizza, to flap its wings and cough a little. There were, however, no forlornest fire dragons in the clouds, nor could there be for, like the dinosaurs, the dodos, and the greater drubbered Wintwok of Steg Bartle Major in the constellation Fraz, and unlike the Boeing 747, which is in plentiful supply, they are all sadly extinct. And the universe shall never know their like again. The reason that a Boeing 747 crops up rather unexpectedly in the above list is not unconnected with the fact that something very similar happened in the lives of Arthur and Fenchurch a moment or two later. They are big things, terrifyingly big. Uh, You know, when one is in the air with you, there is a thunderous attack of air, a moving wall of screaming wind, and you get tossed aside if you're foolish enough to be doing anything remotely like what Arthur and Fenchurch were doing in its close vicinity. 
and they're tossed away like butterflies in the blitz. This time, however, there was no heart-sickening fall or loss of nerve. A regrouping, a regrouping, <laughs> Freudian slip right there. A regrouping moments later, and a wonderful new idea enthusiastically signalled through the buffeting noise. Mrs. E. Capelson of Boston, Massachusetts, was an elderly lady. Indeed, she felt that her life was nearly at an end. She had seen a lot of it, been puzzled by some. But she was a little uneasy to feel at this late stage bored too much. It had all been very pleasant, but all perhaps a little too explicable, a little too routine. With a sigh, she flipped up the little plastic window shutter and looked out over the wing. At first, she thought she ought to call the stewardess. But then she thought, no, damn it, definitely not. This was for her and her alone. By the time her two inexplicable people finally slipped back off the wing and tumbled into the slipstream, she had cheered up an awful lot. She was mostly immensely relieved to think that virtually everything that anybody had ever told her was wrong. The following morning... Arthur and Fenchurch slept very late in the alley, despite the continual wail of furniture being restored. The following night, they did it all over again, only this time with Sony Walkman. Another slurp of tea. This is all very wonderful, said Fenchurch a few days later, but I do need to know what has happened to me. You you see, there's this difference between us, that you lost something and found it again, and I found something and lost it. I need to find it again. She had to go out for the day, so Arthur settled down for a day of telephoning. Murray Bost Henson was a journalist on one of the papers with the small pages and big print. It would be pleasant to be able to say that he was none the worse for this, but sadly this was not the case. He happened to be the only journalist that Arthur knew, so Arthur phoned him anyway. Arthur, my old soup spoon, my old silver terrine, how particularly stunning to hear from you. Someone told me you'd gone off in a space or something. Murray had his own special kind of conversation language which, he, which he'd invented for his own use and which no one else was able to speak or even to follow. Hardly any of it made any sense at all and the bits which did mean anything were so often so wonderfully buried that no one could ever spot them slipping past in the avalanche of nonsense. The time when you did find out later which bits he did mean was often a bad time for all concerned. What? said Arthur. Just a rumour, my old elephant tusk, my little green baize card table, just a rumour. Probably means nothing at all, but I may need a quote from you. Nothing to say, just pub talk. We thrive on it, my old prosthetic limb, we thrive on it. Plus, it would fit like a what's it in one of those other things with the other stories we have the other week. So, uh, it could be just you denying it. Uh, excuse me, something's just fallen out of my ear. There was a slight pause, at the end of which Murray bossed Henson came back on the line, sounding genuinely shaken. Just remembered, he said, what an odd evening I had last night. Anyway, my old, I won't say what, how do you feel about having ridden on Halley's Comet? I haven't, said Arthur with a suppressed sigh, ridden on Halley's Comet. OK, how do you feel about not having ridden on Halley's Comet? Pretty relaxed, Murray. 
There was a pause while Murray wrote this down. Good enough for me, Arthur. Good enough for me. Good enough for Ethel and me and the chickens. Fits in with the general weirdness of the week. Week of the weirdos, we're thinking of calling it. Good, eh? Very good. Got a ring to it. First, we have this man who it always rains on. What? Yeah, it's the absolute stocking top truth, all documented in his little black book. It all checks out at every single fun-loving level. The Met Office is going ice-cold, thick banana whips, and funny little men in white coats are flying in from all over the world with their little rulers and boxes and drip feeds. This man is the bee's knees, Arthur. He is the wasp's nipples. He is, I would go so far to say, the entire set of erogenous zones of every major flying insect in the Western world. We're calling him the Rain God. I say. I think I've met him. Good ring to... What did you say? I may have met him. Complains all the time, yes? Incredible. You met the Rain God? If it's the same guy, I told him to stop complaining and show someone his book. There was an impressed pause from Murray Bost Henson's end of the phone. Well, <laughs> well, you did a bundle, an absolute bundle. An absolute bundle has been done by you. Listen, do you know how much a tour operator is paying that guy not to go to Malaga this year? I mean, forget irrigating the Sahara and boring stuff like that. This guy has a whole new career ahead of him, just avoiding places for money. The man's turning into a monster after we might even have to take make him win the bingo. Uh, listen... We may have to do a feature on you, Arthur. The man who made the rain god rain. Ooh, yeah, got a ring to it, eh? A uh, nice one, but we may need to photograph you under a garden shower, but that'll be OK. Where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm in Islington. Listen, Murray, Islington, yes. Well, what about that for the real weirdness of the week, the really seriously loopy stuff? You know anything about these flying people? Uh, no. You must have. It's this is. I mean, it's a real seethingly crazy one. This is the real meatballs in the batter. Locals are phoning in all the time to say there's this couple who go flying nights. We've got guys down in our photo labs working through the night to put together a genuine photograph. You must have heard. No. Arthur, where have you been? Oh, space. You've been in space. I got your quote. But that was months ago. Listen, it's night after night this week, my old cheese grater, right on your patch. The couple just fly around the sky and start doing all kinds of stuff. And I don't mean looking through walls or pretending to be box girder bridges. You don't know anything? No. Arthur, it's almost expressively, inexpressibly delicious conversing with you, chum bum. But I have to go. I'll send a guy with a camera and the hose. Give me the address. I'm ready and waiting. Listen, Murray, I asked, I called to ask you something. I have a lot to do. I just wanted to find out something about the dolphins. No story. Last year's news. Forget it. Forget them. They're gone. It's important. Listen, no one will touch it. You can't sustain a story, you know, when only the only news is the continuing absence of whatever it is the story is about. Not our territory, anyway. Try the Sundays. Maybe they'll run a little what happened to whatever happened to whatever happened to the dolphin story in a couple of years around August. But what's anybody got to go, going to do now? Dolphins still gone? Continuing dolphin absence? Dolphins further days without them? The story dies, Arthur. It lies down and kicks its little feet in the air and presently goes to the great golden spike in the sky, my old fruit bat. Murray, I'm not interested in whether it's a story. I just want to find out how I can get in touch with that guy in California who claims to know something about it. I thought you might know. People are beginning to talk, said Fenchurch that evening after they'd hauled her cello in. Not only talk, said Arthur, but print in big, bold letters under the bingo prizes. Why is it... Which is why I thought I'd better get these. He showed her the long, narrow booklets of airline tickets. Arthur, she said, hugging him. Does that mean you managed to talk to him? I have had a day, said Arthur, of extreme telephonic exhaustion. I have spoken to virtually every department of virtually every paper in Fleet Street. And finally, I tracked his number down. You've obviously been working hard. You're drenched with sweat, poor darling. 
Ah, no, not with sweat, said Arthur wearily. A photographer's just been. I tried to argue, but never mind. The point is, yes. You spoke to him. I spoke to his wife. She said he was too weird to come to the phone right now, and I could call back. He sat down heavily, realised that he was missing something, and went to the fridge to find it. Want a drink? Would commit murder to get one. I always know I'm in for a tough time when my cello teacher looks me up and down and says, Ah, yes, my dear, I think a little Tchaikovsky today. I called again, said Arthur, and she said that he was 3.2 light years away from the phone and that I should call back. Ah. I called again. She said the situation had improved. He was now a mere 2.6 light years from the phone, but it was still a long way to shout. You don't suppose, said Fenchurch doubtfully, that there's anyone else we can talk to? It gets worse, said Arthur. I spoke to someone on a science magazine who actually knows him, and he said that John Watson will not only believe, but will actually have absolute proof, often dictated to him by angels with golden beards and green wings and Dr. Scholl footwear, that the month's most fashionable silly theory is true. For people who question the validity of these visions, he will triumphantly produce the clogs in question. And that's as far as you get. Ooh, I didn't realise it was that bad, said Fenchurch quietly. She fiddled listlessly with the tickets. I phoned Mrs Watson again, said Arthur. Her name, by the way, and you may wish to know this, is Arcane Jill. I see. I'm glad you see. I thought you mightn't believe any of this. So when I called her this time, I used the telephone answering machine to record the call. He went across to the telephone machine and fiddled and fumed with all its buttons for a while, because it was the one which was particularly recommended by Witch magazine and is almost impossible to use without going completely mad. Ah, here it is, he said at last, wiping the sweat from his brow. The voice was thin and crackly with its journey to a geostationary satellite and back, but it was also hauntingly calm. Perhaps I should explain, Arcane Jill Watson's voice said, that the phone is in fact in a room that he never comes into. It's in the asylum, you see. Wanko the Sane does not like to enter the asylum, and so he does not. I feel you should know this because it may save you phoning. If you would like to meet him, this is very easily arranged. All you have to do is walk in. He will only meet people outside the asylum. Arthur's voice said it's most mystified. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Where is the asylum? Where is the asylum? Arcane Jill Watson again. Have you ever read the instructions on a packet of toothpicks? On the tape, Arthur's voice had to admit that he had not. You may want to do that. You may find that it clarifies things for you a little. You may find that it indicates you to you where the asylum is. Thank you. The sound on the phone line went dead. Arthur turned the machine off. Well, I suppose we can regard that as an invitation, he said with a shrug. I actually managed to get the address from a guy on the science magazine. Fenchurch looked up at him again with a thoughtful frown and looked at the tickets again. Do you think it's worth it? she said. Well, said Arthur, the one thing that everyone I spoke to agreed on, apart from the fact that they all thought he was barking mad, is that he does know more than any man living about dolphins. And with the time just crossing over the Rubicon of 2203 here in Denmark... We'll call it a day for this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you, again, for joining me. Um, I hope, as I say, you've had a, a great start to the new year. Uh, this will be uh, a continuing Sunday night event um, towards the end of the, of the five-book trilogy. 
um, please do. Uh, um, I, I, I was teased by uh, Facebook. They wouldn't let me do a multiple event on this, so I will try and figure out how to do that and make sure we've got multiple events on this. But it will be happening again uh, regularly uh, every Sunday at uh, uh, 2100 CET, um, however that translates into wherever you are in the world listening to this. And I will, of course, be doing edited versions of this uh, onto the podcast as well. Uh, but thanks again for joining me, everyone. Um, don't forget, if you can, to become a patron uh, by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit um, and help uh, make, uh, make it easier for me to keep doing this stuff for you. Um, but in the meantime, stay safe, be sensible, uh, look after yourselves, look, everyone, look after everyone else around you, and I will see you all next week. Thanks very much for this week. See you guys. Bye now.